Nadia Alali is the director of the Center of, for, of Middle East Studies at Brown University in the US, uh, where she's professor of anthropology and Middle East studies. Uh, among the books that she's written are What Kind of Liberation, Women and the Occupation of Iraq, co-authored with Nicola Pratt, and Iraqi Women, Untold Stories from 1948 to the Present, uh, which was published in 2007. Maysoon Pachachi is a London-based filmmaker of Iraqi origin. Uh, in 2004, with Kasim Abid, she co-founded the Independent Film and Television College, a free of charge film training center in Baghdad. And among the films that she's made is Our River, Our Sky, uh, which came out in 2021, which takes place, the action of which takes place in Baghdad in 2006. And the film was shot entirely in Iraq in 2019. And I, I believe there's gonna be an uh, a, a showing of that in London in a few days. I guess Maxine will give us the details. And another film in 1994, Iraqi Women, Voices from Exile. So um, with that, uh, we're gonna hand over to Naja and Maysoon to um, uh, take us forward. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you. Should I, um, we, we, yes, Nadia, Nadia and I, um, got together, set up, uh, act together, uh, Women's Action for Iraq in 1999. And it was absolutely in response to the sanctions, which were tearing the fabric, the social fabric of the whole of Iraq uh, to bits. And uh, as Mill said, um, um, caused many deaths. I mean, I mean UNICEF said that 1,500,000, 1,500,000 um, 1, children died. Um, because what, what the sanctions, which were amongst the most severe and punitive in history did was actually um, impoverish, incredibly impoverish the society. And as I say, um, destroy the social fabric. And, um, and at the same time, of course, people were dealing with the effects of uh, the bombings in, 19, in the 91 Gulf War, um, where there was depleted uranium used to, um, on, uh, the weapons were tipped with depleted uranium, as a result of which you had a, uh, an incredible increase in childhood cancers, and cancers generally, but especially children. Um, so it was a very, you know, it was in a mess, Iraq, before 2003, anyway. Um, and um, we, I mean, the kinds of things that we did is that we were, we were in touch with people in Iraq, um, and so we were collecting stories and we were trying to get them out and disseminate them and talk about what was going on there. We tried to send things that um, like books to Iraq. Um, and because there's a lot that you couldn't send, there were no medicines being sent. I mean, there was other charities that were working on medicines and so forth. Um, and so we, we, yeah, we carried on with these um, activities and, uh, you know, wrote to, um, you know, all our MPs and all the rest of it and went out on demonstrations. Um, so what, what we would do, one of the, one of the um, last things that we did before, as, as the war was beginning, was to have an exhibition. We had an exhibition uh, here in London at the Diorama, which is near Regent's Park. And it was, we asked people Iraqi people who were living in this country and other countries in the diaspora, um, but and had left Iraq, uh, probably for political reasons, to send us something that they bought from the country, and to that was important to them, and to write a little blurb that said what was the significance of this object. And people sent us all kinds of things, they, you know, like um, you know, a dress, a biology notebook from high school, you know, a bullet casing, a, some soap. Um, musical instruments, carpets, all kinds of things with extraordinary stories behind them. And um, the day of the invasion, the first the 19th, 19th of March, um, somebody from the Guardian came uh, to interview us and see what the exhibition was about. And he said to me, the first thing he said to me is, are you Shi'a or Sunni? 
and and I my blood ran cold because I just thought, oh, so this is what it is going to be. They're dividing the country in this way. Um, it was it was really shocking. And indeed, of course, that's what went on. That's what what happened. That's what the um, Americans set up um, as a governance, you know, as a government uh, is is representational by by sect, by sectarian religious parties and so forth, which was fairly disastrous. So, no idea. Yeah, yeah and uh, maybe to add to what uh, Maisun was uh, um, talking about in terms of the context of establishing Act Together. I think it's important to mention that we also grew out of uh, a sense of discomfort with some of the UK-based or also US-based anti-sanctions and anti-war activism. Um, so we felt that um, except for a few groups, I mean, I would say Women in Black and also Voices in the Wilderness UK, there was this tendency amongst anti-sanctions and anti-war activists to focus on the impact of um, UK and US uh, imperialist policies in Iraq, but gloss over the atrocities of the regime of Saddam Hussein. And many of us, especially those with you know, family in Iraq or had lived in Iraq, uh, some of us actually had experienced um, you know, arrest and political persecution um, at the hands of the Ba'ath regime really felt uncomfortable with this kind of dichotomous approach to the situation. So that was another important strand that motivated Act Together. And I think that also is important to mention in the context of the post-invasion and occupation period, um, you know, where there was a tendency amongst um, some people, including some Iraqis, I'd say, um, you know, to very much focus on of course, uh, it, it was important to focus on the devastating impact of the US invasion. But in that context, there was sometimes a tendency to, to my mind, glorify uh, the resistance to the US occupation, which translated in practice uh, often into actually the killing of innocent Iraqis. Um, you know, we can have a uh, discussion whether you know translators or police were complicit in the occupation but the reality is that they were Iraqis as well and the the resistance also translated into bombs that exploded at marketplaces and you know on streets and and so on now unfortunately uh we uh, all our sort of worst nightmares in terms of uh, the invasion and the occupation came true um, we um, knew that it wouldn't bring democracy, human rights, and uh, liberation to women. Although I think none of us could have expected, could have imagined the extent to which um, the invasion and occupation were really um, messed up. I'm not trying to argue that there's a good way to invade a country militarily. But having said that, I mean, the truth is also that even those who were opposed to the invasion, there was a moment of hope when the regime fell, when the regime of Saddam Hussein fell. Um, but uh, of course, uh, unfortunately, what we've seen unfolding was a series of uh, incredibly um, bad decisions. You know, we can uh, discuss whether it was a conspiracy and a US-led invasion wanted this uh, to fail or whether it was incompetence or both. Um, now, the outcome of that was in, in any uh, case that uh, Iraq went through an uh, incredibly um, horrible period of chaos, of lawlessness, um, normalization of violence, uh, the proliferation of militia, whether these were sectarian militia or political militia. Um, and the biggest losers in all of this uh, were women who were at the receiving end of much of the violence, particularly different forms of gender-based violence. And, uh, you know, again, despite this rhetoric of women's liberation, women's issues were the first thing that fell off everyone's agenda. Uh, although uh, President Bush and uh, Tony Blair at the time used women as symbolic markers, they, they spoke about women being the midwives of the new Iraq. 
uh, but in practice, uh, women lost out badly. And this is not to say that um, men did not lose out, but in terms of the shift towards greater social conservatism, uh, in terms of the uh, different forms of gender-based violence, the feminization of poverty, the impact of displacement. I think it's really important to stress that um, Iraq, which has a history of displacement due to wars and repression, following the invasion, there was another huge wave. And uh, especially people who were in mixed marriages, that is, uh, you know, mixed in terms of mainly Sunni and Shia, or more secular, but for all kinds of different reasons, um, many, many Iraqis either were internally displaced or had to um, flee the country. So um, from, in all levels, whether it's political, the kind of uh, reification and institutionalization of sectarianism, whether it's in terms of infrastructure, an infrastructure that, as Maysoon already pointed out, suffered greatly during the 13 years of economic sanctions, got further decimated in the context of, of the invasion. Um, now, I, uh, in the in interest of time, I mean, we can talk about the specifics later on, but um, I want to uh, hand over back to Maysoon, who's going to say something about um, the fact that, I mean, Iraqis, well, okay, so before I hand over to Maysoon, I just want to say one more word, which is, I think 20 years on, it would be a mistake, though, to read Iraq only in terms of the lens of the US-led invasion. Because while I certainly hold the US-led invasion responsible for facilitating much what followed, I think we need to recognize also the important role of regional actors, so predominantly Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar, as well as the devastating role of sectarian corrupt politicians who have been governing Iraq since 2003. And you know, while they um you know, their coming to power has been facilitated by the US. I don't think we can reduce Iraqis are not just puppets. Um, so there is lots of complicity and responsibility at the hands of militia and politicians as well. Um, over to you, back over to you, Maysoon. Yes, okay. Um, I was I was in, um, I, made, I made a film as, as uh, was um, mentioned by um, Milan. Um, in 2019, but for some years before that, I was going back and forth to Iraq to do research and meet people and so forth. In 2019, there was a massive, massive uprising um, in uh, in Iraq, and it was largely triggered and, um, you know, inspired by the youth of the country who were fed up with the kind of the, the corruption and the and the lack of of um, uh, you know, infrastructure, lack of electricity, lack of jobs, lack of everything, and and um, it was a it really was a massive uprising, and you know some paid with their lives because the militias of the various parties were you know there was there were snipers among them they were using um, military grade uh, uh, tear gas and aiming it at people's heads and so forth. But the the people were steadfast, and the important thing about this. Was I mean their 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 um their initial motto was we want a homeland we want a country that is actually ours and that it was calling for all the foreign um, interventionists to to leave um, but also it was calling for systemic change in in the government you know beyond the corruption and and with with human rights as its core and um, it it drew in. It drew. It was. It started with the young people, but it drew in many people from um, all walks of life. I mean, different. Uh, first of all, it, it transcended the sectarian divides. So, you know, Shia, Sunni, everybody was there. The Christians, the Turkmans, everybody, and they were people from the country that were coming into the cities to join the protests. They were um, doctors who came to treat the wounded. And you know, spent the nights in the in the in Tahrir Square, which is the big square in the middle of uh, Baghdad. And something, I mean, although they were not able to to affect or get the kind of change they were really asking for, something radical, I think, changed in the in the population. There was a sense of empowerment and voice that they had, a, you know, that and and a lack of fear. It was. Uh, 
extraordinary. And I went back last year at this time in March um, and it felt like a different place. There was an, an extraordinary kind of creative energy, especially among the young um, and of, of rebuilding of, um, for example, I was in Mosul for, um, for a while and I did a, a documentary film workshop there. And um, we walking through the old city, which is where ISIS had really um, been. Um, which was rubble, a very beautiful old uh, city, beautiful architecture, but uh, wrecked basically. So people were sort of cleaning up the rubble and cleaning up um, and trying to restore it to some extent. And then, you know, you would go to uh, somebody's sister's wedding and it was all, I mean, it was full of life and full of kind of resistance to damage, basically. There's a resilience in in Iraqis, I think, because they've got a, a long history of, um, you know, building up and things being crashed to the ground and building up and crashed to the ground. And I think that that's there. And I, and I, and this gives me hope. I mean, what I saw there and it's sort of different kind of energy that was um, evident to me, which I didn't expect to find. Mm. Just maybe a couple of minutes, just following up on what Maysoon was saying in terms of um, women's mobilization. I mean, I sort of painted this quite uh, grim picture in terms of the impact of the invasion and occupation. And I, would, and I mean, I always said that, you know, women were the biggest losers in the context of the invasion and occupation and the aftermath. But at the same time, and it's really important to point out that women were not just passive victims and um, there was a mushrooming of women's organizations following the invasion uh, and a sort of growth of civil society um, and uh, sort of across the board, I mean, more secular organizations, more religious, those linked to political parties, independent ones. Um, and even at times when it was uh, posing a risk, I mean, women were taking a risk to their lives in being active. Um, they continued, I mean, at some point had to go for the underground. Um, but I think it is really important to to mention that despite um you know the hardship despite the the structural inequalities uh, that was that um increased during the occupation um there was there continued to be resistance and you know one story i always like to tell is that so i'm based now in the us and sometimes when i give a talk here people say oh but the, um, the invasion gave women the quota in Iraq. You know, there's a 25% quota enshrined in the constitution. So somehow people uh, know about that. And then I have to remind uh, my audience that it's despite US objection, because when a, when a group of Iraqi women's rights activists went in, um, I think it was in, I'm not sure 2003 or 2004 went to then ambassador Paul Bremer and asked for 50% um, representation in all um, important uh, bodies and uh, in parliament and so on. Uh, Paul Bremer told them we don't do quotas, you know, which was of course um, very ironic given that the whole Iraqi governing council was set up based on quotas, so many Sunnis, so many Shia, Kurds, Christian, and so on. But when it came to women, um, it is despite US opposition that Iraqi women's rights activists inside Iraq and with some support, kind of transnational feminist support, managed to get a 25% quota enshrined in the constitution. Now, did that translate into um, women's empowerment? I mean, not necessarily, because we know that, for, especially in the early days, it was often the wives, daughters, and sisters of conservative male politicians who ended up in parliament. But nevertheless, I think the important point I want to stress here is that um, despite all the hardship, the gender-based violence, the uh, incredibly different everyday lives and the um, failing infrastructure, the feminization of poverty and so on. Um, women have been at the forefront of actually challenging sectarianism and authoritarianism in Iraq. Mm. 